Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this lecture for the PVD course. My name is Barry Brown, I'm a professor at the department and I'm going to be giving you this lecture today. Um, the focus of my work um, at DSV is on um, what's called human-computer interaction and I spend a lot of time trying to study users and try and work out how they think and how they use technology. So that's why I'm, uh, I'm the one who's doing this lecture which is going to teach you a little bit about understanding users and bringing them into the development process. Um, so the lecture itself is split into kind of two halves. The first half is going to talk a little bit about requirements um, and what the role they play on the design of software. And the second part is going to talk a little bit more specifically about user studies and methods that you can use um, as part of studying users. But let's kick off with the first part. So if you've been involved at all in the development of any software or any software products, or indeed even maybe if you even just used software, you'll know that sometimes it doesn't turn out exactly as was intended. Sometimes customers want one thing, the people who run the company, uh, they have another idea for what the software should do. Programmers write different things from what was actually requested. Um, they get documented in different ways. Um, and actually, in the end of the day, actually what the customer needed is often much, much simpler than what any of these people thought. The way that we tend to think about it is that there's kind of two halves to computer system design and development. Firstly is building the thing right, and secondly, building the right thing. By building the thing right, I mean making sure that the software works, make sure that the system does what it should. It's bug free, that it's fast, that it's effective, that it's secure, blah, da, da, da. And it's this half of things which computer science is understandably mainly focused on, um, working out how things like databases should work. So if you have a database, it needs to store information that our program needs to run. If it's uh, storing things, it needs to be secure, needs to be fast, needs to be efficient, needs to be bug free. And if you're storing something like passwords in a database, you need to encode those passwords and not store them in plain text because if somebody manages to hack into the system and steal the database, then, um, then they've got all the passwords. So these are the sort of things that you learn when you do computer science, how to develop databases so that they're secure and work fast. And um, the sort of study of managing software engineering is also mainly focused on this building the thing right. Um, so you have things like bug tracking software, um, you have uh, um, software that lets you like, you know, like GitHub that lets you share source code, you have tools that let you manage the lifecycle software, and there's a lot of work that's been done on planning software, working out um, releases of software, um, and recently of course much more focus on, on, on what we call yeah, agile methods, which I think you might have been, might have been covered in other, other lectures, to quickly and effectively build, uh, build software. Yeah, and that's all very well, isn't it? That's going to build a system that works. But how do you make sure the system actually does something useful? How do you actually decide what you're going to build? What's the overall system goal? Who's going to use your system? What are they going to use it for? Um, what is the sort of world that that system is going to be part of? Because these days, most systems need to connect to other systems. So, um, and this is particularly the case if your system's kind of part of a workplace where there's, you know, other kind of computer systems going on. So some of the systems that you use as a student, you might have to like, you know, for example, the registration of yourself as a student has to be, has to feed into the system that will, you know, track whether, you, you know, what grades you get and let you see your grades. Um, and also the system that like, gives you the security so you can log in to use, say, particular services in the library. So you have to build these things so they actually fit with the, the, the world that they're, they're going to be in. And I, call, I, kind of, I kind of call this building the right thing. How can we work out what we're going to build? How can we work out what features it should have? How can we work out who's going to use the system? And as I said, the world that that, that system's going to, be, going to be part of. Now, 
if you think about deciding what a system is going to do, you might think, well, that's kind of, that's not that hard, is it? I mean, have any here got an app idea? Have you ever had an app idea and thought, oh, if I could just build this app, you could uh, you could make a fortune? My uh, my favourite um, app idea, which I've never built, uh, so I maybe shouldn't tell you it yet, but my favourite app idea would be an app that would store port, uh, codes for doors. You know, like every door here has a kind of code to get into. Well, I would love some app that when I went to that door, it would just pop up a notification and tell me what that code was because I, you know, remembered it. Um, and I thought that would be kind of really great app. But even though there's lots of app ideas and lots of people have had app ideas and actually built those apps and there's a million apps in the app store, turns out most of those apps don't really get used. And indeed, actually, if you look at the rate of, uh, of downloads per apps, some apps uh, at the top of the app store get, get are successful. They get lots and lots of downloads, but the rest of apps don't get, get even downloaded. And then even when you look at whether apps are used, actually, that when they do get downloaded, apps often only are used once or twice. Um, here you can see actually this is the kind of the, the graph of uh, how many apps actually get then get used when they're actually uh, when they're actually downloaded. Um, and rather sadly, um, you can see that um, uh, app developers try and find ways to get people to use apps. So this this what this graph shows you is that if you get people to enable push notifications, they're more likely to uh, to retain them as users of your app. Or of course, they're just like say no and delete the app. Of course. Um, and not just not just apps, um, um, also software startups often fail as well. Um, the sort of startup scene is quite famous. If you've watched um, TV shows like Silicon Valley, or indeed if you've just even been aware and reading the media in Sweden, you'll know there's obviously lots of startups here that have been successful. But it turns out that most startups, most software startups, are not successful. Y Combinator is one of the big funding run, run rounds in the US. They take in a whole bunch of companies um, uh, that, they, that they then fund. Um, only 5% of the companies that actually apply to Y Combinator are accepted and funded. And of them, 87% fail, which means you've got a terribly small success rate of less than 1% for software startups. Um, of course, actually, some of the companies that that, that don't get accepted are successful. So this is maybe a little bit of an underestimate, but let's just say it's really hard to make a software startup uh, work. And unfortunately, even if you are successful at the beginning, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful after that. Um, I don't know if any of you um, had an iPhone in the early days, um, but there was this app called Hipstamatic that some of you might have used. I don't know if you used it. It was a really nice app. It was um, one of the first apps to allow you to put these kind of filters on uh, your images. I think I, th I think a thing we kind of take for granted now. But it had all these really great kind of old fashioned filters that you could put on photographs that you took with the iPhone. So there was like very chrome or, um, you know, infrared, you know, and all these kind of lovely kind of faded colors that made everything look like it was uh, from the 1970s. Um, don't know why people would want to go back to the 1970s, but it seemed lots of people who never lived through the 1970s wanted to go back to there. Um, and Hipstamatic really kind of hit onto that sort of nostalgia. It was one app of the year awards. It had 4 million users, which at that time was kind of like um, unbelievable. Lots of acclaim and awards. Uh, even actually got used for um, a, a photojournalist who used it to document um, his time in uh, in serving in in the U.S. Army in Afghanistan. So really, kind of a, was a kind of real popular and uh, cultural um, success. And then along came Instagram. Kevin Sistrom um, launched a photo sharing service. Uh, they were actually developing another app, and they they came up with this idea of this photo sharing service. And Instagram kind of um, 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 was massively more successful than Hipstamatic. Now it was bought. Uh, it was bought actually by um, uh, uh, for over one billion by Facebook, which at that time was considered ridiculous. But I think actually it's considered now a bit of a bit of a bargain. Um, 
And Instagram's kind of really clever thing it did was it was social. It took the same feature set that Instagram had, but it actually let you share those photographs really easily, make comments um, and share everyone in the world pictures of your breakfast. A great advance for um, society, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, so, uh, for uh, Hipstamatic had 4 million, um, uh, Instagram had over 300 million users by 2015, now it's in the billions. Um, and you see the key thing there was that Hipstamatic forgot what photographs really were for. They're for sharing moments. Um, this is what we used, to, we used to call this the Kodak, uh, the Kodak moment, sharing these kind of moments um, uh, that where you share where you're together with other, other people. So there you go, the billions of billions of users of Instagram. Um, this is just, just up to 2018. Um, and Hipstamatic was successful, let's be honest here. That was probably the best success you could you could hope for, wasn't it, really? Um, actually, most software is much, much, things go much, much worse than that because most, most software doesn't fit the purpose it's designed for. And all sorts of badly plagued, like badly designed software uh, systems plague our world. How many times a day do you have to use some software um, application that's really hard to use? Usually, I would guess when you're forced to use it by a company or an institution. Companies and software often have design compromises that take away actually, you know, really good reasons for using using the software. And software often just simply does the does the wrong thing. I always use this nice example here because I'm sure it's all familiar to you all. This is the SL card machine. And the way it works is that um, I don't well, probably don't need to tell you this, but that you um, you click your card on the front and then it scans your card in, put your credit card in, you pay for your tickets, uh, and then you load your, you know, the credit you've just paid for onto your card by holding it up, um, up uh, against the sensor again. And if you look at these machines, they are full of little stickers to tell you what to do. Because there's a bit here where you're meant to sort of like hold up one card and then a bit there when you're meant to stick in another card which is your bank card and uh yeah so they put more stickers around to try and show you that this is where you put your sl access card and then you know they got more desperate and they started putting these big hands on it to try and tell you not to put the card there to put the card there um and also they still have problems because uh, people often uh, get confused. They either leave their bank card in the machine, or they pay, take their bank card out and forget to to you know tag the card at the end to load the ticket onto the card. Um, and there is some you know you, you might think oh well they're being very stupid here, right? Why didn't you just have it where you sort of like insert the card and it gets kind of held while you're while you're doing the payment. But of course the trouble is then that people then forget to leave their cards in the machine. So it's it's kind of where it is it is a real challenge because they have to have these two different cards. You have to manage these two different cards and then you have to have it that people don't leave those cards in the in the system. And indeed slowly over time SL has been dealing with this because actually the solution to this problem is not to have to have you hold up this thing twice like this. Um, and to do that, you actually need to do centralized ticket authorization. Um, that is to say, have some kind of like database. So you just say, well, this is my card, or even it remembers who you are with your credit card and loads your ticket on automatically. Um, it does that for some ticket types now. Um, and then you have some kind of system that checks over the internet when you go on a bus or go through the, uh, the turnstiles. Or maybe you could even just go with no ticket checks at all. That's actually how the Berlin uh, subway works. And then there are people who come around and, and find you if you're not paid. So, I mean, I think there are other design solutions here that might have potentially been better. But you can see that I don't think they designed this system with these strange stickers because they were stupid, but because they were kind of constrained by how the, how the system was going to work. Um, the worst systems are the ones where people have to use them because then the people who build them don't have to build them well to 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 encourage people to to use them because they don't have a choice. And unfortunately, also workplace systems are often more complex than 
consumer systems. The systems are often poor quality. They have bad user interfaces. They're hard to understand. Sometimes they have incomplete or incorrect functionality. Um, I'm sure you know this yourself from systems that you've used to, uh, if you worked in different different jobs. And unfortunately, also often failed IT systems um, fail for a whole bunch of reasons. But often they fail not just because the systems itself have problems, but actually usually because they don't they don't do the right thing. They don't actually fit with the um, with what these what these systems should actually do. And indeed, there's a quite classic case from the 1990s, which was a big new computer system uh, that was introduced in London to dispatch ambulances. Um, and basically, the management who implemented the system thought, oh, we'll just force through how the, uh, how the dispatch of ambulances works by getting everybody to use this new system. And they decided on one day, everyone would start using the system. And for a whole day, there weren't any ambulances dispatched in the whole of London. Massive disaster. Many people died because of the bad design of this system. And rather tragically, these are the sort of things that happen um, over and over again. Back uh, just in 2017, the same thing happened again when the technical problems hit um, the control room that dispatched ambulances in London. Uh, and it actually meant that they, they could only dispatch ambulances by using good old fashioned radio uh, communications. So the, the, the way that, the, the way that uh, computer science has tried to fix these problems is with a thing called requirements engineering. Trying to find out what the requirements are for a bit of software that's been developed. Like I said at the beginning of the talk, building the right thing. But it turns out this is actually quite a hard thing to do. Uh, there's a really nice quote from Steve Jobs who said, you know, you can't just go out and ask people, you know, what the next big thing. Uh, there's a great quote by Henry Ford. He said, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. And Henry Ford, who invented the first cheap cars, um, he knew that you people didn't really want a faster horse. You have to actually think beyond what your customers and what your users uh, think. Um, two approaches to fixing this have been um, more formal processes, which get called business process engineering. And these are the kind of things that go on in big companies. And you really do need to know these, unfortunately, because they're actually often how a lot of big, big software packages are, are, are developed. But more recently, there's been a move to a more agile requirements process. And so I'm going to also tell you a little about some, uh, some agile, uh, agile processes and how they work. Okay, so in formal requirements processes, uh, often the people who actually develop the system are not the same people as they're going to use the system. Usually, you know, you might put a contract out and some other company will come along, you pay them lots of money and they develop the software for you. So you work on this thing uh, which it goes between those, between those companies called the requirements document. And this is a document that's produced before the programming starts that lists all the features that need to be implemented. Um, and that actually, that actually then often can be part of the contract between the companies. Um, you're actually going to, you know, when they actually want to pay you for the system, it has to fit with what's actually in the, in the contract. And um, this adds a whole bunch of legal uh, requirements to the technical requirements in the system. And this means that these documents are often, you know, they have real, real problems because as you can imagine, you know, the company that makes the software wants to make sure that the people who get the software are going to pay for the software development. And then the people who get the software want to make sure that they get the right, the right software. So it can be quite, quite uh, uh, legalistic. These documents usually have two different types of, two different types of requirements. User requirements, which are high level abstract requirements for like what the users want of the system. And then system requirements, which are sort of specific descriptions of what a system should actually do. And let me give you an example of this. So say you've got a, a big system that, uh, that's used in a medical context for prescribing drugs. You might have a user requirement, something like 
The system shall generate monthly management reports showing the cost of drugs prescribed by each clinic during that month. And then that might actually then break down into these specific system requirements. On the last working day of each month, a summary of the drugs prescribed, their cost, and the prescribing clinics will be generated, blah, blah, blah. So you can see actually like the system requirements go into much more detail than, than a user requirement. Now, the trouble, of course, is that, the, 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 these documents are written in English or Swedish, or they're, they're written in a language, and actual languages can be quite ambiguous. Um, and this can mean that, like, you know, there's crucial decisions about what a system is going to do, and those decisions actually end up getting led to the developers of the system. And developers being busy people usually decide on what's the quickest fix to that particular ambiguity. Often they make their own decision. Some requirements are very, very easy and others can be very, very hard and sometimes even impossible to actually meet. And with any kind of process, like any process, software development often runs out of time and the system has to ship to fit a deadline and these requirements often have to be, have to be cut. One of the hardest things about software is working out what not to do. Uh, often it's important working out what your system shouldn't do or what isn't important to get over what gets called featureitis, where there's too many too many features in the system. There's a thing called a minimal viable product, which is actually this idea that what's the minimum feature set that your system should actually actually do. Um, some of the other things that go into formal requirements engineering processes is the use of scenarios. These are descriptions of cases of use of the system. So these are desc descriptions of the actual use of the system, which describe the actual different features that a user does when they go about completing a task. So for example, uh, you might have something like this, which describes that a user is searching for a patient by a family name, and then they might use like, the date of birth to identify the patient. Um, and then they say like things that might go wrong. Uh, if there's you know something the user isn't found, they might just list some of the other activities that users might that users might have to do. In this case, nurses. And then they actually describe that the you know system state on completion. So while this is still quite formal, you can see it's more about kind of walk, walking through the actual usage of a usage of a system. Um, and these scenarios, they're often also more more written up as use cases. Use cases are, are diagrams where they show the different users and the functions that they can actually do. And this fits well with the sort of diagramming that always that often goes on when they're when you're designing large, large systems. So this is a case here where we have the different users of a system, receptionist, manager, doctor, nurse, and then it sort of tells you some of the functions that they can do and some of the things that they can't do. So for example, a manager can't register a patient because that's something that a receptionist does. Um, one problem with these kind of uh, these kind of documents is they can get quite distant from actual users, and so one technique that's been used to try and improve uh, the development of these requirements documents is, has been called personas. That's where you have these kind of imaginary users of the system, where you kind of put into quite a lot of detail the persona of what uh, what the typical users of a system are going to be. And this is good because it helps you understand the variety of system use and the different goals that users have. Uh, and then from those from those personas, you can actually then create scenarios that go with those, those personas. So this is one, for example, from a, a flight entertainment system that played movies inside a inside a plane and it lists actually the different people who might actually use the, the flight entertainment system and it talks a lot about the different things that they, they might actually um that you then could actually build scenarios for those those different personas for those different users about what they how they might actually use the use the system. Once you have a requirement specification, you often then have a system specification, which involves designing the system, usually with some sort of overview of the architecture of that system as well. And this is kind of moving away from, from these more kind of broad requirements to the more specific system, system descriptions, where you have more system requirements and even describe how the actual system will work, how what its kind of data structures will be like and, 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 and stuff like that. 
Now, as you can imagine, this sort of stuff, while it's useful for building really big systems, and when there's these systems that are getting contracted out to other people to develop, um, in recent years, uh, the, 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 there's been kind of much criticised because it's been argued that this is quite bureaucratic, and it actually ends up um, it actually ends up users kind of not really having uh, much involvement in these processes. And so there's been these kind of uh, this move to more agile requirements processes. So one uh, one approach is that actually when you've got a development team, you actually always have one user who actually has a constant involvement in that development team. So you actually have an end user who's actually physically there saying what they think about different different features. Um, and then also they have this idea that that every feature for the system should be small enough to just be written on a little post-it note or a card so that you can actually put them up in the environment where you're actually doing the development to um, actually uh, manage what features are going to get done in the done in the system. Again, this is really great for much smaller systems, but it is much difficult for complex large systems when you might have, say, even hundreds of programmers working working on that on that system. Um, with an agile requirements process, um, you might still have a one-page description of requirements. You might still use these. You might still have user stories, but um, uh, there's much more kind of like a much more dynamic process uh, with constant testing of a system with actual actual end users. And indeed, there's these things that have kind of recently become quite popular called design sprints, where you get a team together for a week to try and implement some new features or explore new features of using a, using a system um, to find out about users. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that um, in the second half of the lecture. Okay, so I'm going to take a little pause there. Um, and we're going to talk in the next part about user studies.